to um, our, final, our final keynote um, today, which is going to be delivered by um, Professor Zheng Wang, who is the director of the Center um, for Peace and Conflict Studies and a professor um, at the School of Diplomacy and International Relations at Seton Hall University. He is also the Boeing Visiting Chair in International Relations at Schwarzman College um, at Tsinghua University. Um, and Dr. Wang's research interests lie in three closely connected areas. Um, first, identity-based conflicts, nationalism and the politics of historical memory. Second, peace and conflict management in East Asia with a special focus on China's rise and its impact for regional peace and security. Third, domestic foreign domestic linkages in Chinese politics and foreign relations. Dr. Wang is, Wang is the author of the wonderful book, uh, Never Forget National Humiliation, Historical Memory <coughs> in Chinese Politics and Foreign Relations. This book, unsurprisingly, received the International Studies Association's Book of the Year Award in 2013. Dr. Wang has also been a Jennings Randolph Senior Fellow at the, Uni at the United States Institute of Peace, the Dr. Sika Ch um, Chan Endowed Visiting Professor at Fudan University in Shanghai um, in China, um, a Carnegie Fellow at New America, and a Public Policy Scholar at the Wilson Center. In recent years, as if that were not enough, Dr. Wang has received multiple highly competitive fellowships and grants from a number of prestigious institutions. His most recent grant award um, from the Henry Luce Foundation supports his conduct of high-level dialogues and joint research between the US and China over the South China Sea disputes and US China relations. Uh, we are very, very pleased to have you here with us today, um, Professor Wang, and um, you're going to be talking um, about historical memory and wars from, from Ukraine um, to Taiwan. So let me, let me hand over to you and thank you once again for joining us. Thank you, Jade. Thank you for your very kind introduction. And uh, uh, it's really pleased and honored for me to attend uh, this conference and to give uh, today's presentation. Um, so I first, I, I still need to apologize for not being able to attend this conference in person. I planned to attend, but uh, uh, I went to uh, China and after I entered into China, you know, the COVID-0 policy. So um, whenever I need to re-enter China, I need to go through the 10 days collective quarantine, uh, not even be able to live in the room. So, um, so that's the reason I have to attend this meeting in uh, online. Uh, so I'm sorry. I know it's boring to listening someone speaking online. Um, yeah. So um, I prepared some PowerPoints, and uh, so I was sharing my slides, and uh, I probably were. I trying to speak not too long, and so we have more time for discussion and for questions. Um, yeah, so I'm sharing my uh, my slide. Okay, are you able to see my slide? Not yet. Oh, really? Well, I could see them earlier when you shared them, so I'm sure. Okay, I, I just try again. I hope it's not a problem. We can see them now. Okay. Okay, wonderful. <clears throat> okay, so today I hope I could be able to report to you about my uh, research regarding about the historic memory and the conflict in Ukraine and Taiwan. Um, it's, um, I always like to quote our German colleagues regarding the power of history in German politics. Uh, because they mentioned the historic memory is something that um, political scientists normally trying to avoid, but uh, journalists are very often to report. Uh, the reason the scientists, uh, social scientists trying to avoid is because the memory is something is difficult to quantify, it's hard to measure, uh, so it's really not easy to do research. 
but uh, like uh, I like what they said. This is still very, very real, and uh, it's the biggest factor mitigating the exercise of German power. Uh, I have the same conclusion. I think historic memory is also the biggest factor mitigating the exercise of Chinese power. So I will speak further about this. Um, Today, I want to focus on Taiwan and Ukraine. We know that uh, after the uh, the beginning of the Ukraine war, there's a lot of discussion about similarity between Taiwan and Ukraine. Indeed, there's many similarities if we're trying to compare Taiwan and Ukraine. Of course, the, the two countries are very different. Uh, Ukraine is a sovereign state of the uh, United Nations. Taiwan is only recognized by 11 states and is not a member of the United Nations. Taiwan is surrounded by sea and is much smaller um, uh, in, in one of my article, I mentioned Ukraine is 17 times bigger than Taiwan. Uh, but Taiwan is also a major uh, economy, very uh, successful uh, democracy. So um, I think when we trying to compare Taiwan and Ukraine, I think people focus mainly from the perspective of realism and the liberalism. From the liberal, from the realism perspective, uh, we can say the same in the, uh, security dilemma in both Ukraine situation and Taiwan. Just like um, uh, John Mearsheimer, the professor of Chicago University, uh, mentioned that war becomes almost, um, you know, becomes very possible or even inevitable when it between a larger power and a smaller labor. When the smaller labor trying to enter a security alliance with another major power for security and protection from the laboring uh, larger power. So there's kind of same similar dynamics between Taiwan and uh, uh, Ukraine. And from the perspective of liberalism, um, both place, um, we can say there is between the autocratic state and the new democracy. So a lot of people uh, uh, comparing from the liberal, liberalism perspective. Today, I focus mainly from the perspectives of identity politics. Um, so um, we can find a, also a lot of similarities. For example, both Russia and China make the claims of shared heritage, collective memory, identity, culture between the two group of people. Um, and each has the narrative that is full of historic memory and uh, its own interpretation of history. Uh, I'm not an expert on Russia or Ukraine, but when Putin made his speech uh, on February 21, before launch of the war, I was uh, really kind of like surprised that to hear the very same, and I told my students immediately, I said, what he said is immediately is very similar to how the Chinese leader telling the Chinese people. So I just quoted here his speech, which is his own interpretation about the history, about uh, you know, for example, like he mentioned that uh, the people living in the southwest of what has historically been Russian land and has called themselves Russians and Orthodox Christians. Uh, when it comes to the historic destiny of Russia and its people, so he also blamed the former um, Soviet Union leaders for making mistakes for the dissolution of Soviet Union in 1991. So um, that is Putin's narrative about history. And if we look at the, you know, how the part of history being remembered in Russia, I think it's no surprise we know that, for example, the, um, you know, the war memory, um, uh, you know, since 19, many of you, you know much better than me that you know that since 1945, every year, May 9th, there is the, uh, the Victor Day Parade in uh, in Moscow. 
and the people they have a different ways of their holding their parents, grandparents, photos, filming of the river of picture to remember the past history. And for Putin, the collapse of Soviet Union is kind of like trauma, national trauma. And just like Jade mentioned that uh, I wrote two books and uh, mainly one of them mainly focused on the uh, past humiliation or past national trauma and how that became a, a factor influence today's China's politics and foreign relations. So I think maybe I just go over a little bit about the concept of humiliation and past trauma for today's Chinese politics. So I'm showing you a group of photos, and each of the photo use you, you will say you, you say is four Chinese characters. It's the same Chinese character. Uh, so this one is you say that a group of students, college students in Nanjing, they're holding the banner with this four Chinese character. This is a very emotional young young man written these four words on his fist is during a, a demonstration against the Japanese uh, a new textbook in 2005. Uh, and this is a, a senior uh, citizen is telling story, stories to the students and there's a big bell and the four Chinese characters has been put on, the, on this bell. And this is a group of students sign their name on a big banner. It's the same four Chinese character um, during 2012, uh, when China and Japan uh, had a major crisis over the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands. And this one, you see the, this group of the policemen using their body to firm the same four Chinese characters. This four Chinese character, if we translate word by word, is never forget national humiliation. Um, in my book, I call it as national freeze of China because you can say it everywhere. If you visit China, you just like I'm showing you on the big bell, on the walls, on the textbooks, and this humiliation is referring what the Chinese called the century of humiliation from 1840, the first opium war. One of the direct consequence of the war is China sided Hong Kong to UK. And also the second opium war and the first uh, China, uh, the Sino-Japanese war. And the, the result of the war is China, the Qing dynasty, sided Taiwan to Japan. So the humiliation is referring the series of the field foreign invasions and the, the wars, the field wars and with the foreign invasions and the group of unequal treaties, what Chinese people call it unequal treaties, because this treaties, China was forced to setting lands uh, to the foreign countries, uh, and including some other kind of penalties and uh, punishments. So um, the session of Taiwan has been a central part of the so-called national humiliation. So from 1895 until 1945, this 50 years, China, Taiwan was and Japanese rule. Um, so for the uh, in the Chinese history narrative, this is a major um, national humiliation. Yeah. And very often we use this, uh, we call it compl a CMT complex uh, created by the Norwegian scholar Johan Gautum. And he said, we if we're trying to understand a country, especially during the uh, when they're making the decision in a major crisis or conflict, we're trying to understand this partial Chilsonese myth and trauma complex. So we can say the similar kind of dynamic of this trauma and myth complex in both 
uh, the China and the Russian case towards Ukraine and Taiwan. So um, the, the trauma is that what they, uh, of course, both trauma and glory can be highly selective. Uh, people, today's people, they selected, um, you know, they only choose some of the historic events and they, um, you know, just like the China case, they call it national humiliation. And for Putin, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I quoted from his another article, uh, another address, just several days from the uh, February 21 address. And he asked, what is happening? He said, the answer is simple. Um, so he talks again about the trauma of the Soviet Union. Soviet Union grew weaker and broke apart. And, uh, uh, and for him, the, this trauma is associated with the past glories, uh, he believes, or some Russians believed. Um, and for the Chinese case, the reason many people ask me why today's chi today's China became so much more stronger, became a major power, why people are still talking about the humiliation. So I told them this, uh, you know, because just because the you know today's success makes them to have this complex, the trauma and glory complex somehow reinforce each other. Today's success and the past civilization, the glories they believe, the myths they believed on themselves, make them so difficult. In the Chinese case, so difficult to forget um, the trauma part, the national experience they encountered uh, during these one hundred years. So this. Uh, um, Today's success and the past glories and the past traumas reinforce each other and forms a very powerful and profound complex. Um, and this complex plays a very important role in the foreign policy decision making. And particularly, I think when we talk about historical memory, I think we are not just talking about how a group of people remember about past or just some kind of like a collective memory because collective memory um, is, you know, for each individual, there might be the different kind of, you know, understanding about that. The reason I think we're trying to discuss about the function of historic memory, uh, I believe it's because historic memory uh, is such an important raw material for constructing national identity, especially in some societies. Um, historic memory plays much more important role compared with some other countries in terms of the national identity formation. And so the argument is that because collective historic memory is a key element in the construction of national identity. Uh, and we all know that foreign policy is based on this group of people's understanding of national interest. Uh, and the national interest in turn determine foreign policy. So I think that's the, uh, the connections because the historic memory uh, firms or plays a very important role for the formation of national identity. And national interests are constructed by national identity. So then we understand how and why that uh, historical memory can influence foreign policy making. Um, and um, I think one of the conclusion I made in my book is that uh, I believe the historic memory um, in China um, is one of the biggest driving force shaping and constrain China's foreign policy. And it's also the most important context for us to understand in China's new nationalism. Um, I also call it it's a national ideas for China. Um, and, uh, I think one thing I should add is that one of the reasons that historic memory became such a, um, 
important factor in Chinese politics and foreign policy is because the, uh, the education system, propaganda system, uh, is all emphasizing uh, this part of the history, especially after the um, 1989, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Eastern Europe communist states, uh, the Chinese government uh, facing this, uh, the, um, the crisis of legitimacy. And they began to use historic memory, especially based on the national humiliation, the past wars, to construct their legitimacy and to trying to emphasize it only because the party, China became an independent state and ended the national humiliation. Uh, so that's, I think, is a very important background. And I think we have the same, we, can, we see the same in a situation how Putin emphasizing the history and also um, the, the rewriting of the history textbook and curriculum. We have been saying that it's happened in both Russia and China. Uh, um, so I think uh, I want to trying to have a discussion about why this, or maybe I, I just um, trying to propose, uh, we can call it a theory of uh, historic memory and uh, uh, conflict, especially um, st uh, course state, uh, state conflict. I think there's four contexts of historic memory in uh, any state or society. It's the, the level of the historic consciousness among the group of people, whether it's very high or it's relatively low, and also the level of the political usage of historic memory. Uh, and the level of reconciliation of the past conflicts and trauma. Uh, whether they have uh, the past uh, traumas and conflict being you know, healed or not, or there's still a lack of reconciliation, that makes a difference. And finally, the level of openness and the diversity of opinion regarding historic issues, whether this country allows the open discussion about history, or it the government, the elite is really trying to providing an official narrative and ask people to accept it and believe it. So that is also the level of openness uh, regarding the historic interpretations. So in China's case, we can find that China has a high level or we can say very high level of historic consciousness. Uh, like some people uh, saying that in China, history is a religion uh, and also very high level of political usage of historic memory. But at the same time, we see the relatively low level of reconciliation of the past conflict. There's two, I think, I believe you know very well, like the uh, between China and Japan, there's still lack of a good reconciliation. Uh, uh, and there's a you know very low level of openness and diversity opinion towards historic issues. Uh, the entire China using the same history textbook, the official narrative uh, being you know asked to for all the students to learn, and this uh, uh, the, the so-called patriotic education has been used in all the different aspects of social life, uh, public media. Uh, even including entertainment, the movies, songs is all being used to uh, for the information about the official narrative of the history. We could also say the similar situation in Russia, that is the higher level of history consciousness, political usage of historic memory, and a relatively low reconciliation and openness and diversity. 
And in this kind of situation, so I propose, uh, like I said, and I'm still working on it. So I'm, I very much welcome your opinions regarding, uh, you know, um, how can we develop a theory of historic memory and conflict. So my um, hypothesis is like that. For a society of a country, our bilateral relationship, there, if there exists a higher level of the sense of victimization and historic consciousness and uh, uh, political usage of the victimhood, but at the same time, a low level of the healing and reconciliation and the low level of the openness and the diversity of opinions regarding the historic issues. And for such a society, the historic memory, the victimhood are not just a psychological issue or something related only to emotions and attitudes. They are the key elements of constructing national identity and influencing foreign policy decision making. So I think my argument is that in such kind of society or country, historic memory is no longer just related with people's attitude or psychology. Uh, it becomes a key element constructing national identity and influence foreign policy making. And such a bilateral ship, bilateral relationship becomes conflict prone, especially when there is an emergency or there is incidents that cause new suffering or there is incidents touch upon sensitive historic symbols. So that's my propose of a theory of historic memory and conflict. Like I mentioned, I'm still working on it. I'm just to uh, submit this for um, for your attention and I welcome your comments, suggestions and questions. And going back to Taiwan, I just quickly just uh, talks about how how historic memory help us to understand understand the current situation of Taiwan. Uh, like I said, that most of people, when they talk about Taiwan or Ukraine, they focus on geopolitical analysis, uh, but to feel to pay attention to the very important uh, uh, role the identity politics and historic memory plays. So in the past several decades, we have witnessed the major identity shifts in Taiwan. Uh, and um, so the conflict between China and Taiwan has been experienced several different, uh, you know, period of development. From this, uh, nine, from the 1949 to 1995, this is a conflict over power. Uh, so both sides claim they are the right China. They are the right government to represent entire China. Uh, so until today, Taiwan or, people, or Republic of China's uh, constitution it still claims the entire territory of China, even including Mongolia. So this is a period of time the conflict, the source of conflict is mainly focused on power struggle and the right government. But then after Taiwan's first presidential election democratization, we say the conflict, the source of conflict changed and shifted from the conflict over power to conflict over identity. And we say the strong and rapid development of Taiwanese independent movement. And also the growth of the pro-independent party in Taiwan. And you say there's a very uh, detailed um, public opinions so we post conducted it in Taiwan, we will say that more and more Taiwanese consider themselves as only Taiwanese and no longer Chinese. So today we probably can only say the 2% people in Taiwan still consider them as Chinese. And also more and more people um, 
became they prefer either uh, the maintain the status quo or they they hope that the they can their country can move towards independence. Those for support for unification became smaller and smaller. So this is a change of the identity in Taiwan. Um, so um, today I think the danger of this issue if we're the analysis of identity politics can telling us is that the, all the three parties involving this conflict, they have a dream. China's dream is unification and this dream is so strong, the determination is so strong. And in Taiwan, a lot of people, they dream of independence. And in the US, there's a growing number of people, they think they say the opportunity to use Taiwan to weaken or defeat China. Uh, in the past, the majority of the American policy community, they believe that uh, maintain the status quo and uh, not encourage Taiwan independence belong to Taiwan, uh, belong to the US national interest. But now um, we can say there's more people uh, say the opportunity of using Taiwan to weaken China. So the driving force is the change of the balance of power between China and Taiwan and between China and the United States, the shifting identity in Taiwan, uh, uh, and also the change of the policy of the United States towards Taiwan. So that's make the situation much more dangerous. So if anybody asked me several years ago, do you worry about a conflict, a war in Taiwan? I, I most likely will say no, because there's much more factors actually pre, um, working on to um, avoiding the conflict, because the conflict doesn't be, didn't belong to the interest of any party. But now, like I mentioned here, is we say that there's more and more factors somehow go into a wrong direction. So I just quickly showing that the um, you know, <laughs> unification using force by China now becomes much more possible compared with even just five or 10 years ago. Uh, so that is also an important factor. When we're trying to emphasize in identity politics, we are not trying to say that the, uh, the, the geopolitics or realist politics are not, um, they are also very important factor or foundations for us to understand the situation. Um, and uh, <clears throat> China has been preparing for the conflict for, or for the invasion for decades. So for example, that people find that China has been uh, conducting this kind of one-on-one -on -one reproduction of Taiwan's presidential hall in their major military training sites. And also they also have one, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one reproduction of the major airport of Taiwan for, pro for the war simulations. So they have been preparing this, for decades and the determination is only just became stronger uh, with the uh, identity politics developed in China. And the Chinese government put the Taiwan's reunification as a major uh, state objectives. Uh, it's called the national rejuvenate, rejuven, rejuvenation. They are not using the word you know, the outside word normally saying China's rice, but in China, people are using the word rejuvenation. Uh, it's emphasizing it's not coming from, uh, you know, it's, it's returning from uh, to the past glory. So that's the reason using the word rejuvenation. Yeah. Um, so I think. If we trying to, from the perspective of historical memory, if I have opportunity to communicate with policy maker of the three parties, I probably were first thing I want to telling them is that I believe deterrence doesn't work when it comes to identity. 
So basically, I was telling the American side is that the U.S. greater protection and further armament of Taiwan will not make Taiwan will not make China choose to give up. Um, it's probably just uh, working the opposite way because now this is somehow is like the main policy from the U.S. or some other countries is that oh because there's bigger danger. So we should give China greater protection and further armament. But uh, my argument is that this is not a conflict over power, conflict over interest. This is conflict over identity. China's understanding about Taiwan is based on identity, is not based on territory or based on semiconductors. So deterrence doesn't work. It's the same thing, just like we are saying, China's cohesion in the past decades uh, also didn't work to make Taiwanese to change their identity. And it won't work for the future because people will not change their identity even at the gun point. So I think my first um, policy advice will be deterrence doesn't work when it comes to identity. And because this is identity-based conflict, like I already mentioned. I just quoted from one of the very popular uh, US policy commentator. Um, he said there, if there's central recurring mistakes the United States make when dealing with Rust word is that, I think basically if I trying to summarize what he said is that he's overlooked the important role culture identity played in other nations, other group of peoples, uh, you know, um, for their understanding about the conflict and also uh, their, their real objectives. Uh, so I think my second um, uh, advice would be we need to understand the source of conflict before conducting any intervention. Uh, so if this is an uh, identity-based conflict, we won't be able to find a solution through the geopolitic approach, and we won't find a good solution. We're probably doing the opposite if we're trying to just uh, using the power struggle model, like I mentioned, providing great support or armament. Uh, and also the Chinese side should also realize that the, uh, the, the bigger pressure to Taiwan will also not work the way that Beijing hoped to say. Um, but I think my frustration is that um, even though I believe many of you probably agree with me regarding these two, uh, two recommendations, but uh, it's extremely difficult to uh, convey um, these kind of ideas to the policy makers, even the scholars um, in other fields to make them to, uh, to agree that historic memory plays a very important role. And also we need to um, find a different way or different approach to deal with identity-based conflict, even to agree to recognize this is also an identity-based conflict. Because for, like I mentioned, for many of the policy makers, inc including scholars, they mainly say Ukraine, say Taiwan, from the perspective of the realist and uh, uh, from the geopolitic analysis. So that's probably the tragedy. And I also, um, you know, looking forward to your questions, especially your suggestions regarding how can we more effectively communicate the knowledge of historic memory with policymakers and um, um, the other, you know, other peoples and scholars. So I will stop here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Zheng. That was that was comprehensive and incredibly enlightening. Um, I'm going to we're going to go to questions now. First of all, I'm going to invite 
Um, let me first invite anybody who's joined us online to enter their questions into the chat. And then um, whilst, um, whilst we do that, um, and before turning to questions in the audience, I actually am going to completely abuse my position as moderator to ask um, a couple of questions just relating to your theory of um, the role of historical memory and its relationship to conflict, which I found fascinating. Um, and, and very convincing. And the only question I had really was how you were defining historical consciousness um, and whether or not that's the understanding or sort of knowledge of history or whether or not it's the understanding and knowledge of that nation's cultural memory. Um, because uh, just thinking about the Russian case, polls in Russia have shown that actually it's the people who know less uh, or fewer historical facts about um, World War II, about the Great Patriotic War, about the, the battles. They, those people who know less, so fewer facts, they are more likely to subscribe to the Kremlin-supported kind of uh, memory um, of, the, of the war. Um, so it wouldn't really be, in some ways, knowledge of history makes you less likely, well, I mean, it's perhaps not that surprising sitting outside of Russia, but knowledge of history makes you less likely to agree with the Kremlin's view of history. Mm. Um, so that would be one, one question. And then I also, it's slightly different, but um, I, I was also interested, you, you stressed the importance of sort of symbols um, to, to these, the, um, to, to these, the, this sort of formation of identity, and, but I wondered there, to what extent um, that's, of course, dependent on the actor using the symbols, because um, whilst, say, in, in, in Russia, of course, uh, again, I'll just go to the Russian case because that's where the, I, I know better, but, I mean, Russia the, and sort of actors close to the Kremlin and within the Kremlin have worked, for example, um, closely and, and even provided support to, to Slovak neo-Nazi parties that dress up in the outfits of, of um, Joseph Tiso's sort of um, Nazi collaborating um, uh, sort of World War II government. So I don't think the issue, I don't think their actual problem is with is with um, people who who have collaborated with the Nazis. That their, their problem is is of course with with. Um, with ideas of Ukrainianness, and it almost feels like they then use the sort of the the specter of, of Bandera to to, to frame um, or to, to discredit Ukrainian nationals. So, although, although I completely agree with you that that these these concerns about historical memory are, are entirely real, how do we also factor in that they are also sometimes just a convenient way to, to discredit the enemy without losing the importance of that identity-based? Um, a feature of the conflict. Mm. Mm. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, Jay. Thank you for the question. I think very, uh, very good two questions. Uh, yes, I. Yeah, like you said, that uh, uh, it's not so easy to measure to quantify the historic consciousness. Uh, so I think probably we 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 trying to say this way is that historic consciously is of course that uh, um, for each society is different, but there are some indicators of historic consciously. Uh, for example, whether the historic events, uh, for example, one of the indicator of the historic memory in Russia is that uh, this group of people, like I mentioned, they conduct this victory day parade every year you know, never stop. And this kind of using the ceremony, this anniversary for remember history. And in China, the same thing, the uh, rip of Nanjing, it becomes a national anniversary every year, the same day, the entire country conducting the different kind of activities for that day. And history consciously, so I think, is also including, um, you know, whether the historic events being uh, reproduced in today's uh, like popular culture, not only just uh, the history textbook or history teaching, whether it's being, you know, reproduced and uh, uh, being circulated uh, among the people in the different media. 
Um, so I think there's different ways we're trying to, um, even it's not, uh, we don't probably have um, difficult to find a scientific way to, to quantify the history consciously, but there are some indicators. Um, but of course, in a society like China, it's probably much easier to say these indicators uh, because it's mainly uh, controlled or uh, people may be using the word manipulated uh, by the government. We can say many of these. And uh, uh, I'm not expert of Russia, but uh, um, from my uh, speaking with some of the Russian people, including some of my students, I can say also the Putin's efforts of uh, trying to giving people, Russian people, a kind of like official narrative about uh, what happened in the past. And also your second question regarding the symbols. I think, yes, the um, to some extent, the historic memory identity politics is always highly symbolic. Uh, so um, in Putin's speech, uh, I think about speech, he, I think one thing he tried hard to do is collected what happened today in Ukraine with Nazi, uh, you know, the national trauma with uh, uh, World War II. So they call them, they repeatedly telling people this is new Nazi. Uh, so, um, and in China's case, I think there's uh, a lot of this kind of historic symbols and anniversaries and events being used by the leadership. Um, so uh, there's more this kind of, uh, you know, mobilization of using the historic events. Yeah. Thank so. you. Thank you very much, Hing. Um I'm going to go to questions from the audience now. So um, I don't know if who wants to start. Okay, shall I start with um, it, it, Doug? Mm. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for... A, a wonderful and comprehensive um, uh, approach on such an important topic. Um, one of your main points is that mm. identity has a kind of um, a salience um, and importance that other interests um, you know, don't, that, that institutions can't necessarily mollify identity concerns. Um, I wonder, though, if we engage in these conflicts, if we engage in these issues um, at the identity level, how static these identities are. So um, the, the idea of Taiwanese identity versus, versus Chinese you know, identity, um, that those aren't necessarily fixed in time. There's been, there's been alterations. And um, I'm thinking of ways that those of us interested in building you know, peace in these communities, the understanding of memory as, as, as a peace building measure, um, how effective um, creation of memory discourses that become more inclusive rather than exclusive, more building, you know, commonalities, memory alliances, um, uh, you know, creations of narratives that allow for space for all the different groups um, asserting, asserting their identity, not necessarily at the institutional level, where I think international relations has tended to focus, but at the memory level, shared mm. common memories. So I'd love to get your thoughts on that as a possibility. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, it's an uh, um, excellent question. And um, yes, um, Yes, I, I agree with you. Memory, historical memory, and the people's collective memory is uh, uh, is not like fixed. Uh, actually, what happened in China recent decades is uh, what happened in both China and Taiwan in recent decades is a wonderful example of the changing of people's collective memory. And this change can be reached uh, by through the, uh, you know, in China's case, uh, the change of the history textbook, history curriculum, 
Um, you know, during 1960s, 1970s, that uh, uh, that generation of people, when they receive education in China, at that time, Chairman Mao's period of time, China didn't mention much about the national humiliation. Chairman Mao's history narrative is full of uh, this kind of weaker narrative, emphasizing China was the victor of the World War II and uh, using the class struggle to uh, explain, to interpret what happened in the past. Uh, but uh, only after 1989, 1991, uh, China government <laughs> facing this legitimacy crisis, especially following the collapse of the, uh, the communist and socialist uh, ideology. They need a new ideology to fill the vacuum and they began to use historic memory, especially national humiliation, as a major content for, uh, you know, uh, uh, promoting this kind of nationalistic uh, approach of the ideology. So that's, I think, is very important background. And we're already seeing today's the dramatic change of the perception in China. And Taiwan is another case. It's also in recent just two or three decades after the democratization and the, 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 uh, the, the schools in Taiwan begin to using the new textbook is no longer emphasizing Taiwan is a part of China, but uh, trying to uh, what do they call the Taiwanization focusing on local history, local politics, local geography, and no longer, uh, in China's perspective, is uh, disconnecting the collections between mainland and China. We also say the, and the elections play the very uh, effective way of uh, mobilizing people in another way. So we say the dramatic change of the identity in both China and Taiwan, and historic memory, history education played a very important role in both cases. And even when it talks about the future conflict, because a lot of people trying to persuade some people in China is that if you conquer, if you're using force, how can you govern the rebellions? Uh, because people don't like you. Uh, and uh, you, you probably heard there, there's already a Chinese diplomat is mentioning, senior diplomat mentioning that we can re-educate them, yeah. give us 20 years and uh, change the history textbook, we can change the identity. So this is kind of terrible narrative, terrible discussion about the using history education uh, for this kind of identity shifting. Uh, so, um, so yeah, like I said, I agree with you. Um, um, this uh, historic memory and identity is not fixed, but uh, um, uh, I think the future conflict resolution, we must find a, a good way, a peaceful way, trying to hacking people to dialogue. Um, to, it's not only just dialogue about how to um, find a a management or how to manage today's conflict or tension, but how to communicate regarding about their understanding of, of history. Just like this is always a core issue between China and Japan for the reconciliation. So I think the this is also a challenge for uh, people, especially when the two society growing um, uh, became much more um, with uh, you know this uh, political usage of past and the political mobilization of using past. How can we get rid of this? I think that is a real challenge. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm now just before um, going back to the audience. I'll just ask two questions that have come through on the chat, if that's okay, and then I'll come back to audience questions. Um, I'll give you um, both of these questions together, if that's okay, um, Zheng. Yeah. So the first question is from Katrin um, Bachleitner, who um, who says, "I really like your theory of historical memory and conflict, and and I believe she does because there's an exclamation mark." But it made me also wonder if there's a chicken and egg problem hidden within it. 
Is it that a lingering conflict awakens historical consciousness and the mobilization of memory? Second question um, comes from Alexandra Brodowska at the Polish Support Center for Culture um, in Ukraine. And she says, thank you, Professor Zheng Wang. It was a very inspiring presentation. I would like to ask, what are your thoughts on the role of international actors in identity-based conflicts, especially the role of actors such as UNESCO, for example? What I mean is that it seems that in the Russian-Ukrainian war, it is culture and all of its manifestations that are being targeted and remain extremely vulnerable, proving that existing international law protecting cultural heritage in war is no longer effective. What are your thoughts on the international security architecture and how it might or should be reshaped by identity-based conflicts? Okay, um, yeah, thank you. Um, I think both are very good questions. The first question, um, yeah, chicken egg, I, I probably will saying this way. Um, um, I think today's conflict um, actually reinforce people's uh, past, uh, I mean, historic consciousness and uh, the traumas or historic memory about past conflict. Uh, in other words, that uh, the tensions, um, today's tensions, today's, especially I think we will talk about the, uh, the uh, exchange of these um, hosti uh, hosti uh, hostilities and uh, rhetorics between the two societies very often play a very negative role of reinforce the other side's historic consciousness or historic of the negative attitudes based on history. We can find a lot of examples, like for example, that uh, uh, between China and Taiwan. Uh, in the past, I think for many years, there is a, um, a belief between the two sides. Uh, and if we translate into English, is Chinese don't beat Chinese. Because we believe that this the same ethnic groups, 93% and 95% of Chinese and Taiwanese are belong to the same ethnic group. So Chinese don't beat Chinese. But uh, during the pandemic, I think uh, this kind of uh, because the tension, because this uh, rhetoric and especially the media role about the, how the two societies that there some of the narrative, some of the po politicians, uh, like some of the politicians in Taiwan until now is still calling the coronavirus Wuhan virus. And for many of the Chinese, they think this is intentional and uh, it's very bad uh, behavior. So, um, I mean, today's conflict can reinforce, um, you know, people's uh, consciously about past conflict. And for the second question, um, yes, um, um, I believe that we need more international actors. Uh, you, you mentioned the UNESCO and the UNESCO and uh, other organizations. I think indeed just uh, we need more uh, these uh, organizations to conducting works related with trying to um, working with the identity politics rather than, but I'm a quite pessimistic. I, to some extent, and especially when I discuss about the situation of Taiwan, I'm pessimistic. I somehow think about that today's international system are not ready, or, not, or in other words, are not designed to prevent the identity-based conflict from the outbreak of the identity-based conflict. Like uh, if, I trying to have more discussion about how to prevent conflict in Taiwan. Um, and we found it so, so difficult. Or oh, even you can search all the publications about Taiwan. 
it's somehow most of them, you know, I, you can find a very few publications is discussing about a concrete measures or concrete things we can do to prevent conflict. All the publication focus on geopolitical analysis, focus about, uh, you know, how to uh, uh, protecting Taiwan or shipping more, uh, you know, the armament of Taiwan, this kind of discussion, rather than trying to find, uh, uh, um, you know, trying to, 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 uh, to find a solution or any parties would like to play the role as facilitator or mediator to trying to f mediating the conflict. So that's the reason I said I'm a little pessimistic about the, whether our current global system are ready for mediating identity-based, uh, world will based conflict. Yeah, thank you. Before going back to questions, I'm so sorry. Um, I'm slightly worried that the um, okay, this is oh, it doesn't matter. That's fine. Sorry, it's just this um, this laptop just ran out of battery, and I was worried that then we would lose Sheng. Um, but it's okay. It seems it doesn't matter. Um, now, finally, you've waited so long. <laughs> Please, oh, yes, they'll bring your bring you the mic. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Susan Stewart. I'm from the German Institute for International and Security Affairs in Berlin. Um, thank you so much for this really fascinating presentation. I have a couple of questions. The first one is going back to the, the similarities and differences between the cases of Ukraine and Taiwan that you mentioned at the beginning. Um, I wonder, because in the, in the case, I personally am a, a political scientist and a regional specialist on Ukraine and Russia, so I know that uh, case much better. Um, and there are strong arguments to be made that in that case, in the case of Ukraine, uh, the concern is, or one concern is that Vladimir Putin would not uh, stop sort of with Ukraine because you have this this kind of track record of uh, this, this type of behavior with regard to Georgia, Moldova, and, and Ukraine as well. Um, so I'm wondering if there's a similar discourse or a similar concern with regard to the Taiwan case. Because the way you presented it in terms of the national humiliation, it sounded like actually it, it refers mainly to Hong Kong and Taiwan. So one could, one could argue that then after, after the sort of re-taking Taiwan, this would be kind of... Uh, Concluded, let's say, which would be, uh, I think, a difference to the to the case of of Ukraine. Uh, so I'm I'm wondering how you see that. Um, and then, if you could maybe say something more about this linkage that you presented between glory and trauma, because it, as I understood it, your argument is that uh, kind of today's success makes the traumas and humiliations of the past actually less bearable. And one could see it the other way around, that, or one could ask, why isn't it that, that um, current glory doesn't make it easier to um, become reconciled to the humil humiliations of the past, or that those humiliations would become actually stronger when one is not powerful and when there isn't glory, because then one would focus more on them and say, we could have been powerful and we could have had glory if we hadn't been humiliated in the past. So I, I'm wondering about that uh, linkage. And then um, just very briefly uh, at the end, your, your statement about deterrence does not work when it comes to identity. Um, I, I see that argument. It seems, how, it seems to imply that actually the entire current Western strategy with regard to Ukraine is flawed, at least to the extent that um, the historical identity questions play a role for Russia in the war. And, um, and you presented some arguments that they do, and I, I think there are arguments that they do. So I'm wondering whether that would be your message, and if so, whether you see some kind of alternative policy. Thanks. OK, thank you. Very thoughtful questions. Um, yeah. Um, the first question, um, yeah, I think the people has been discussing about also what will be next after Taiwan or whether uh, this is uh, uh, 
you know, the Taiwan will be uh, because China has directly connected Taiwan's unification as national uh, as the completion of national rejuvenation. So, uh, of course, there will be questions whether there will be other territory or other, you know, uh, claims after that. Um, I think this is um, um, it's um, related with the official history narrative. Uh, for example, actually, uh, if we use the same standards, um, then some people, as I know, some Chinese until now believe that some part of today's Russia's Far East used to be part of China, right? So if we use the same criteria, maybe some people should claim that, should argue that China should also uh, to get them back. Yeah, it's actually huge because in China, there's always a narrative that, um, that uh, 1.5 million square kilometers Chinese territory being occupied by Russia uh, during the, uh, the national humiliation. But this part of history is no longer really emphasized in today's history narratives. So you won't say this kind of anti-Russia sentiments among today's young people in China. Uh, but Taiwan has been always being emphasized, has always been became. So that's a reason I trying to highlight this is that people, many people in the U.S. didn't, uh, you know, hasn't paying uh, enough attention about that the highly symbolic position of Taiwan. So people put Taiwan as the a major, that's the reason put Taiwan as a major thing for the so-called national unification, uh, national reju uh, rejuvenation. So, um, and also uh, China has been repeatedly saying that uh, China is the only major country hasn't realized national reunification. So Taiwan is the last piece. Uh, so that's the narrative. Uh, so I think going back to your question, I believe this is uh, also related with official narrative. Uh, what is, uh, you know, otherwise there will be, uh, you know, probably um, some other place being mentioned, like I mentioned about Russia. The second question I think is a great question. Uh, is um, the relationship between glory and the trauma. Yes, I think normally people believe time is healing. And also today's success will help people to uh, not necessarily forget, but to no longer that king on the past traumas. Um, but I think the in China's case, this uh, choosing trauma, choosing glory complex, is mainly because the past trauma or the so-called national humiliation being um, highly, uh, whether we call it political usage or being highly, um, being highlighted, being um, heavily used in the domestic narrative. So it became such a powerful force. And so that makes that uh, for people, they think today's new success, um, you know, um, even make it even for some people, even make it have a stronger willingness. Is so that's a reason why the national objective of the what I mentioned about the national rejuvenation became so becomes kind of like the signature policy platform for the government, not only just current government, but the recent several administrations, they emphasizing the same thing, the national rejuvenation, because they must find that they got the uh, supports from the general public on that. Uh, so uh, people are uh, have a, such a strong willingness and a determination of making their country strong and uh, um, rich 
Um, of course, many people may argue that this can be a positive force in China. It's a kind of like a positive nationalism. Uh, some Chinese scholars also argue this positive nationalism has been an important driving force uh, in the past decades uh, to explain the economic development, um, the you know China's rising up, uh, because the general public they have this kind of sharing willingness and determination, and they, to some extent, they are even willing to make sacrifice of their personal interest to support the realization of these grand collective objectives. So this, we have this kind of discussions, uh, like I mentioned, at least some Chinese scholars think this way. Uh, the last question, I think, um, um, yeah, the, how can we find alternative ways? Um, uh, like I said, the, I'm, I'm, um, I don't know. I, 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 I'm not very familiar with the situation of Ukraine, but uh, like the situation of Taiwan, I couldn't find uh, or think of any really effective way. Even now, the conflict, the war not really happening. But uh, how can we do something to send messages um, and trying to um, to do something, I, I I couldn't find any really really effective way to do that. Yeah, so that's the reason I said I'm a pessimistic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that rather depressing ending to your answer, um, and thank you for, for the wonderful questions. They were certainly worth the wait. Do we have um, we have time for for one last question? If if there's oh there's two. Okay, well let me take both of them and then from from Hans and then from Dimitri. Um. Uh, Zheng, thank you, uh, Hans. Good work. Thanks for this great talk and mm -hmm. the. Um, I, I probably was not the only one that was drawing a diagram for some of the places that they know based on the, how you kind of charted history, uh, the kind of the theory of historical memory. I think in retrospect, I mean, we're part of the reason why we're all sitting here is Hegel yeah, and the kind of impact that all of this has had over time. And Hegel, of course, has said that the all of Minerva flies at dusk. And we now look at the last 30 years, back at the last 30 years in very different ways since uh, the beginning of February, and maybe with a degree of clarity, understanding what that period was and what it wasn't. And so with relations uh, in relationship to Russia, can identify maybe a bit more clearly what the turning points are. Uh, you had very persuasively highlighted those four letters. And I was just wondering, uh, how, what are points where, from your, from your perspective, that became the dominant narrative? Uh, what, what can we, is it kind of straight after the early 90s, or is that a more recent phenomenon that that has become one of the key themes? Uh, Hans, can, can you uh, just, uh, uh, so your question is uh, about the narrative of national humiliation. Yes, the, the, this uh, never forget national humiliation. At what point, I mean, I'm sure that there are antecedents in the way that we kind of see, again, the parallel to Ukraine. We can see, of course, the, the, the Munich speech of Putin. But I do think most mm -hmm. people agree that 2014 is the kind of watershed moment when we mm -hmm. clearly see that there's a path towards... Uh, kind of ramping up uh, uh, aggre the aggression. Now, I wonder mm -hmm. when you look at the current situation in China and the way that this never forget national humiliation, how that's a theme, what are key points there when it really becomes a very, very strong theme? Mm -hmm. Hence, it's really great to see you. Yeah. Um, Zheng, sorry, yeah. one second. Uh, We're just going to take a second question from Dimitri so okay. you can answer yeah, them together yeah, just for yeah. time reasons, sorry. It's yeah, always lovely yeah. to see hands. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, first of all, for the interesting lecture. I'm Dimitri Matic from the Institute of Recent History of Serbia in Belgrade. Um, I mean, uh, I want to uh, thank the previous uh, speaker for partially at least stealing my question. <laughs> I was uh, thinking about uh, the fascinating term historical rejuvenation. So my question would be from a perspective of a historian. 
it's interesting it's interesting to see how uh, it's being constructed I mean what are the key historical points of reference when did this when did this national humiliation end and when did this rejuvenation begin are there several points of reference is there one single uh, time period or event I mean it's probably hard to define it through a single event but uh, I'm imagining there are several points of reference. So my question would be, uh, when did this, uh, according to the official narrative, when did this national humiliation end? And, and when uh, did the rejuvenation, this term, when did it begin? So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think both your questions are actually connected and uh, um, so I can answer together. Um, yeah, just think about uh, a country and um, a group of people of Chinese. They are very proud, always very proud of their uh, ancient achieve, uh, achievement and civilization and history. But uh, they experienced these unusual 100 years. Uh, so for this group of people, this is not something, uh, of course, when we talk about historical memory, we can say this is manipulated by the government. But what really happened during the 100 years are uh, real. The, you know, we, if we visited many museums in China, you can find that the, these things are not fakeed. They are the, really happened for many of the Chinese families. They have their family stories related with, um, you know, these wars during these 100 years. Uh, so think about that. Uh, uh, during the war with Japan, Japan occupied almost the entire East Coast and many of the inner provinces. So for many cities, many peoples, this uh, history, this part of the national experience is uh, trauma. It's, uh, it's something really, you know, for them never forget. But the narrative is very, like I mentioned, I'm sorry, I, 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 because I don't have time, so I didn't explain very clearly in, during my presentation, is that um, after, China, after Ch uh, Chinese Communist Party came into power and uh, founded the People's Republic of China in 1949, at that time, like I mentioned, Chairman Mao focused on a narrative of victory. So there's no emphasizing of national humiliation. Even before that, uh, when the, you know, the, like the uh, Kuomintang government, the nationalist government, um, they, they actually emphasizing a lot of national humiliation. But uh, after Chairman Mao came into Beijing and uh, he focused on, you know, China was a victor and a, a class struggle theory. And this is until the um, students' movement in 1989 and the major, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And at that time, China, the regime facing the major crisis of the ideology, um, you know, legitimacy. Uh, so they began to, so the turning point we will say is 1992. This is the time when China began to launch the so-called patriotic education. The patriotic education is such a major comprehensive social movement. It's including change of the history textbook, narratives, curriculum, but it's also including introducing kind of like a reinterpretation of China's history class struggle being replaced by ethnic-based uh, conflict, China, Russia, China, Japan, and a large number of the movies, the public um, popular culture products being produced. So that's the reason people are talking about today's Chinese young people. They were born after 1980s. They received the entire patriotic education from kindergarten to uh, college, not only just high schools, college. So their 
uh, in other words, for example, I just give you an example. I have been trying to, I have been facilitating a youth dialogue with uh, uh, elite college students attended from China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. And I found a very interesting phenomenon is that uh, the Chinese students from mainland China, they are very familiar with what happened during this 100 years, but they know almost nothing about what happened in 1989. But as the students in Hong Kong, from Hong Kong, they know very well about 1989 because this being, you know, a part of the Hong Kong's recent narrative after returning of Hong Kong as a part of the uh, narrative of democracy and freedom. So they are very familiar with that. So you can say that uh, um, the very different kind of memories. So uh, going back to your questions, the turning points in 1992, and uh, and you can say this powerful role of the history education and uh, uh, the education campaign played in reshaping people's understanding and collective beliefs. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Xing. And on that note, um, it, it, we're only one minute past, which feels like much better time management than I managed in yesterday's. Um, panel. So um, let me thank you once again for joining us, for delivering such a fascinating keynote um, and uh, also a lot of food for thought in terms of your the new theorizations um, that you're making. Thank you as well to our audience for the wonderful questions, both online and, and in person. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. I really, I'm sorry. I really hope I can join you in person. I believe that I can continue some discussion during the coffee break, during the lunch or dinner table. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.